Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Ken Sherman. And in this episode, I have the privilege to interview golfing legend Barb Moxness. Barb qualified for the LPGA Tour in 1978 and was a consistent top 10 finisher. She finished in the top 10 in all LPGA majors, including the USGA Women's Open, the Nabisco Dinosaur, the LPGA Championship, and the Du Maurier Classic. She had three second-place finishes while on the LPGA Tour and finished 18th on the money list in 1982. She also played on the victorious LPGA Pioneer Cup team in 1982 against Japan. Barb retired from full-time competition on the LPGA Tour in 1986 to be a stay-at-home mom and returned to professional golf in 2000 with a renewed confidence and eagerness, playing the official LPGA Senior Tour, the Legends Tour. She won the Bueller Classic in 2005 and the JCI Challenge in 2014. She's a consistent top 10 finisher on the Legends Tour and ranks fourth on the career points list. She has served on the board of directors for the Legends Tour, and as a member of the LPGA Teaching Club and Professional Division, she won the 2012 and 2018 LPGA TNCP Senior National Championship, winning the tour by 11 shots. Barb finished 12th in the inaugural USGA Women's Senior Open in Chicago in 2018 and finished 7th in the 2019 USGA Women's Senior Open. She's also written several books that bring insight into how the physical, psychological, and spiritual all work holistically in golfing. And today, she's here to share her passion, her mission, and her keys to success. Let's talk with Barb. Hi, Barb. Thanks for being on the show today. So, Barb, tell us a little bit about who do you help and how do you help them? Well, I'm a golf professional, and I feel like what I do with my profession is that I help golfers, and especially frustrated golfers who don't have any answers for their golf game, have some answers and free them up to be athletic, free them up to to love golf again and have fun with it, to make things simple for them. In a lot of ways, what I feel like I do is rescue people who have lost their confidence and their hope. I see it every day on the teaching tee. Um, Golf is not fun for them. And I make it simple and fun. And they go out and play and come back with a big smile on their face. It can be really frustrating as a golfer if you're not good at the game, right? So how is your method different than other ways of instructing? Well, back in 1986, um, I met a guy on a driving range in Carlsbad, where we lived, Carlsbad, California, where we lived at the time. His name's A.J. Bonar. And in half an hour, he changed my life. He taught me how the brain worked. Um, And when you know how the brain works, um, you know how to teach golf in a way that people can do it a lot easier. So it turns out that 42% of your brain is directly to your hands. Only 5% of your brain allocation is to large muscle groups. So what I do is basically 180 degrees different from the way golf is normally taught because I don't work with the body's body uh, functions. I don't work with the large muscles of the body. I work with the hands. And what I do is I take a golf club and we'll call it a tool and I teach people how to use the tool with their hands. And everybody can do this because 25% of your brain allocation is directly to your eyes. So now that 67% of your brain allocation is eye-hand coordination, which everybody Mm. has. It's a God-given thing. I've never met a student that can't do what I tell them based on this premise. So I teach them how to use the tool and teach them how to hit the golf ball with the tool. It's like taking a hammer in your hand. If I tell you you're going to pound a nail with a hammer, you instinctively know what you're going to do with that, with that instrument and that tool. So that's where I try and get golfers to say, this is my tool. This is the best, my best friend. I'm going to use this and I'm going to hit a golf ball. And when they do that, they start having fun. That's great, Barb. Tell, tell me a little bit about your objective or your mission with what you do. My objective is, is basically to help frustrated golfers get out of that cycle to help them have fun again. But one of the things that I'm hoping down the road will happen is that the PGA and the LPGA will look at a different approach to teaching because frankly, we're losing people in the golf industry. I have students come to me every day that look at me and say, 
look, I'm ready to quit the game. I've tried everything there is to try. I'm getting worse. And it's all of this stuff that's thrown at them that shuts them down and they can't be athletic. So I'm hoping that the PGA and the LPJ will look at a simpler method and this type of method to help people play the game. And then we're going to grow it. But right now we're not. It's, it's a frustration for too many people. Tell me a little bit about how you got started in this. When did you know that you know, golf was the career path for you? And tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I grew up in uh, western Minnesota, a small town, 5,000 people. We had a nine-hole golf course, and uh, I started playing at age 10. Um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I was athletic. In my first tournament, I played at age 13 and won my very first tournament. And it was, I mean, there wasn't much going on in women's golf at that time. That was the mid-60s. I was born in 53, so this was like 1965. There wasn't a whole lot going on, but I had this instinct that I wanted to be part of the golf profession. So I got to the LPJ Tour. I played at the LPJ Tour about 10 years and went home to be a mother to our kids. But I left the LPJ Tour very frustrated because I was a good athlete. I played college basketball. Everything I did was, was athletically well done. I was really good at everything. I t- went to golf. And I'm like, okay, I was a top 10 player, but I never won. I'm frustrated. Why didn't I get to where I went, wanted to get to? So in the, in the next 14 years of my life, from 1986 to 2000, I spent that time understanding the physical, the mental, and the spiritual parts of golf that prevented me from getting to where I wanted to go. I met a guy in 1986, AJ Bonar, who I talked about before who helped me understand all the physical parts, which worked into the mental part as well. But then I went back to play the senior tour, senior women's golf in 2000. And from 2000 to now, I've won four times. I'm in the top five in the career list on the Legends Tour, which is like the Champions Tour for women. Um, I've finished in the top 10 in the USGA Women's Senior Open. And, And my career just went upward from 2000 to now, based on what I learned from 1986 to 2000. And so I've taken those concepts that I've learned, I put them in some books, but I've also used them in my playing and I've used them with my students. So since 1986, I've been teaching the same way and watching people go up. So in in my mind, what I'm bringing to people is a sense of redemption, a sense of there's a better way to do this and and I've experienced it, and I want you to experience it. And so that's why I'm passionate about it, because I know what it did for me. I see it on the lesson tee every day, what it does for other students. And I want to just pass that on to more people so they can have more fun with the game. You mentioned A.J. Bonar. Uh, were there any other mentors or coaches or role models, perhaps, along the way that you followed or, or mimicked in your career? A.J. was the best for me. He's the one that encouraged me. He's he's probably been my biggest role model. He taught me everything I know. He still teaches in San Diego today, and uh, I have great respect for him. He's very smart. His father was a tool maker, and so he looked at golf from the idea that, okay, the golf club is a tool. How do you use it? And when he understood the principles of the golf club itself, then he knew how to teach it, and he knew how to have students use it. And that's what he taught me. So he's been my, my greatest mentor. What happens if people don't get coaching from a qualified instructor like you? Is it that they develop bad habits that are then hard to break? Or, or maybe what can happen if they don't get qualified instruction? You know, I see people every day who have gone to many teachers, and they come to me and they look at me and they say, I'm desperate. I've tried everything there is. My mind is full of stuff and I can't hit the golf ball anymore. And that's what I try and undo to try and set these people free to be athletic again, which they're capable of. So again, I look at my instruction as frankly about 180 degree different from what a lot of people who I teach come with when they come to see me and they'll come to the range and I'll have them do a few exercises to start 
And then they'll turn and they'll look at me with look of astonishment on their face. And they say to themselves, and they say to me, wow, I can do this because they lost all their confidence. And then they look at me and they say, I just did that, didn't I? And I go, yes, you did. And you can do it more than once. And then they look at me and they say, why hasn't anyone told me this before? And I get that question with almost every student that I have. It's an interesting approach and and sounds like a very successful one. What are some of the struggles and obstacles that you had to overcome along the way to see success in your career? And how did you manage that? When I first went into teaching um, this method and using it to play, you know, it was so successful to me. So an example is I hadn't played a competitive round for two years after I left the tour in 1986. And then I met AJ and I went back and I played a competitive event on the LPGA. And my first round, I shot 67. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is this is just so so much easier. I can't believe it. But to pass this knowledge on from my experience to other people was the obstacle because it was too simple. And what people think in golf is that you need more knowledge, but knowledge in golf is not power. Knowledge hurts you. It shuts down all your neuromotor systems. It shuts down your ability to play the game. And so the biggest obstacle I've had is to help people understand it is that simple and you can do it and you don't have to put anything else on your burner, so to speak. You don't have to add anything else to the equation. Trust me that what I'm telling you is that simple and it works. And that's how you become an athlete. So most people, what they do is they will come and take a lesson and then they'll start hitting a couple bad shots and they'll go, well, what am I doing wrong? Go back to what's simple. Don't add anything to the equation. Go back to the tool. Learn to use the tool. And then they can continue to go forward. But if you if you start adding all this knowledge and all of this golf swing jargon to your brain, you shut down what you're capable of doing. It's an interesting approach, Barb. Uh, You know, most people think they have to have the latest grip or the latest club or they have to have some special tool or apparatus to help their swing. But it sounds like what it really is is your hand eye coordination. It's your brain to your hand. Uh, so it's a, it's a really unique and interesting approach. I've, I've never heard anyone sort of promoting that. Uh, it's always been about mm-hmm. the next greatest thing you got to go out and buy or the next different, you know, aid, golf aid or whatever it is to help your swing. What's the one thing you've learned about seeing success as a professional golfer along the way that you maybe didn't expect? I think the biggest thing is to realize how mental this game is. Uh, most people approach it from a very physical level and try and put in motion something from a physical level. But what you have to understand is there's a huge mind-body connection that allows you to play the game the way you want to or the way you expect yourself to. And over the years, that's always been the thing that I've had to work at the most is when I go back into competition or when I'm playing a round of golf of any kind, I have to get my mind and my body working together. And that's why I like this method so much, because when I use the tool with my hands, I'm connecting that mind-body, making that mind-body connection a lot stronger. And now I can focus the right way and gain confidence and, and get myself in a good mental state of mind where I can actually play the game better. So where golf is, is probably 95% mental. And a huge part of that is the mind-body connection, which goes down into the psychological. Um, and that was the thing that I was missing when I was first on tour. And the thing that I learned in those 14 years that I was away from it was that part of it, which when I came back to it, I saw really help and, and make me a better player. And when you look at the great players um, and you look at their physical skills, they're good. They're good physical skills, but their mind is stronger. They have greater confidence, they have greater vision, they see things in a positive way, and they're able to use that with the mind-body connection and really become a great player. So not everyone that's in the Hall of Fame has as great a physical skills as sometimes you give them credit for. Their mind is actually stronger, I believe. That's amazing. So true. Golf is such a mental game, right? Your mind has to be strong Mm -hmm. to be a good player. 
you no matter how mm-hmm. good your, your your physical skills are, right? Um, Barb, yeah. now you've, you've mentioned you've written a couple of books. Tell us a little bit about your books that you've written and how it was that you became an author. Well, the first book that I wrote um, has been published oh, probably six or seven years now. It's called Golf from the Inside Out. That was basically what I learned in the 14 years that I was away from the game between 1986 and 2000. And I put it in book form and, and I call it the book of redemption. Because I, in, the, in the book, I tell a lot of my story of where I was and the things that I was using to try and play the game and how I was not being successful and then what I learned and how that propelled me to a place of success. So I took all those concepts and I put it in three different sections. One's physical, one's psychological, and one has a spiritual base to it. That was the first book I wrote. The second book um, is called Connect the Dots with Mini Mox. And basically what it is, is an illustrated book that takes the first book and condenses it down to about a 30 minute read. My son, who's a graphic designer, did all the graphics on it. People love it, but it's a really fun book to read. It takes the concepts from the first book and just puts it in a real simple form so people can go through it and read it and walk away with, with a vision in their mind to see what they're trying to do. And I've had a lot of good comments on it. People love it. So, so Barb, there was a gap there in your career. You mentioned you took time off to, uh, to raise your children. How had golf changed between sort of your first golf career to your second golf career? When I went on tour in 1976, golf was really fun on tour. We had some great camaraderie. Uh, we were all out there by ourselves trying to make it, basically by ourselves learning from week to week what we needed to do to be more successful. And we'd, we walked to the driving range before a competitive round and from all the way from, from one side to the other, everybody would be talking, laughing, having fun with each other. We went on trips together to Japan and all over the world and had great times together. Today, golf is different. There's more money to it. It's a much more of a technical game. Everybody has their entourage, their teams, their coaches, their fitness coaches. The money's gone way up. And so it's a very serious affair. There's a lot of pressure out there to make a lot of money and to be focused constantly. So in my mind, it's not not as fun. The Hmm. golf industry has become very, very number-driven, technical-driven, which the average player cannot put into any kind of practice at all. And so that's what really brings the average player and the amateur player down because they try and get into that and it just stunts any kind of success they could have. We need to go back to that place of fun and simplicity and enjoyment of the game again like it was. It sounds like that's part of what your your coaching and instruction helps them do, right? Sort of break free of the constraints of you know, having it be so number and technical driven and you know, you know, do this, do that, do that. And it's all really just about putting your brain to your hands, thinking about it more. Yes. It's going to be even harder now that, uh, that golf has changed in that way to, to sort of put all of those things in the background and focus on just the game. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I could tell you story after story after story of my encounter with people that are on the driving range or on the golf course trying to play well. And I'll ask them what they're trying to do. And I go, well, can we just throw that out and do this simply? And they'll start playing really, really well. The challenge is to stay there and not go back to all the stuff that stunted that athleticism that you have instinctively and is God given to you. And just stay with, with what you have, which everybody, everybody has the great skills. They just don't know it. So I feel like one of the things that I do as an instructor, my goal is to help people understand that they have the skill and my goal is to bring it out of them and help them see it because it's there. Everybody's got it. What a great story, Barb. You've had a, a, a long career in the golf industry with a little gap there, but you've been able to see the, the transition over time in the, in the industry. That's quite the perspective. What steps along your journey were defining moments in leading you to fulfill your mission? When I, uh, when I met AJ in 1986, that was the first step to put me on this mission. And since that time, I've had tremendous opportunities to deal with a lot of different people and a lot of very influential people. And I've worked with people who are CEOs for com- from companies 
And they look at me with, again, that look of astonishment. Like, really, I did that? And they go, yes, you did that. And so what that's done for me over the years is to just solidify the fact that what I'm doing matters, that what I'm doing is important, because golf is so personal for people. I had a guy that that I taught in Florida who'd been a CEO for a major company for 25 years, and he looked at me and he said, golf is all I have now. You need to help me. That's great. And that's how it is for a lot of people. You know, they go to bed at night and they don't sleep because they had a bad round. So when <laughs> right. I when I see when I see work with people and see that smile on their face and know that what we did helped their life and changed their life, number one, it made them happier. Number two, it gave them more confidence. And number three, it brought them fun again back into their life rather than struggling. That's what makes my mission worthwhile. And so that's why I do what I do. The other part for me is when I went back to play and I was able to win tournaments. I've won four tournaments since I went back as a senior tour player. To be able to see that what I learned and what I put into practice actually works, that makes my mission very fulfilling to me. And I can pass that on to a lot of people. So, Barb, are you actively engaged in instructing uh, a group of students now? Yes, I have students that I teach every week. And are you taking additional students? Uh, Yes, I am. You know, I'll take take people that that need help. That's my goal. My heart is to help people. Never out in that practice tee for me. I'm out there for them. And what does that look like if somebody wanted to reach out to you to perhaps get a, a group of lessons, maybe some mindset training. What does that look like? Do they, do they contact you by phone and set an appointment and, and go from there or kind of describe how that process works? Yeah, they can contact me by phone or they can contact me through my email, through my website, moxiegolfacademy.com. Well, Barb, thank you for taking the time out and, and meeting with us here today on Business Innovators Radio. I want to thank you for your time today. And it has been very interesting uh, learning about your background and and uh, your long history as a golf professional and champion. Thanks so much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be here. Thanks so much, Ken. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.